Well, good morning, Southern Oregon, and happy 4th of July. Alice Lehman, Pete Bell Castro, uh, your host here with The Real Estate Show. We're both brokers here in John L. Scott in Southern Oregon. And Pete, what an interesting week we had. I mean, we, we can't stop saying this every week. Something different happens. We're opening up. We have a heat wave. What's it all doing to real estate? Oh, I don't know what it's doing to real estate, but it's making people nutty all over. Um <laughs> What was it, 113, or that was the high in Medford, 114 in Medford? Oh, my she, gosh. You know, 106 in Cape Falls. I mean, those are all record highs. And uh, uh, it's quite hot, as you know. We've seen fires around us. We've seen smoke in our communities already, Alice, as we've talked about. We still have, you know, this water issue and water crisis that we're seeing in our from our, our rural properties around. So all that, all that's affecting real estate in some ways. But we're still seeing just a lot of demand for what properties come on the market. We've been seeing following it week after week. We know that listings are you know, increasing, increasing around us. So today, uh, Don McCoy uh, has been on our show many times. He's a broker with EXP is going to join us and we're going to get his perspective of what's happening in our market and what to prepare for, for people looking to buy and sell. Because as you, as you say, each week it changes What's kind of hot? What's not? Where's the hot community? What what's selling here and there? What's not? What are interest rates doing? You know that all that is all out there, and it changes literally daily. Uh, the biggest thing though for me is fires right now. Be prepared. It's the Fourth of July weekend. Don't be stupid because man, you know we don't need any of that. Our, 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 we have enough burning going on, and and we got a long summer still to go. And that's probably I think one of the biggest concerns that we would all should all share. Yeah, this weekend over the over the Fourth of July. Yep, and one of the things I want to make sure we talk to Don McCoy about because he's a, a real estate agent that specializes in green construction. I want to get an update from him uh, post pandemic, kind of where is that industry going, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the options that people have because I I think it's getting introduced into our building codes now, so maybe he can address that for us. Well, it, it, the building codes over the years <laughs> literally have come up to those green standards. At one time, it was a gold, silver, bronze standard, you know, that you got rated. And literally, those have, those have all changed over time to where all new construction is pretty much green construction. You can, you can call it that with energy efficient appliances, the smart homes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's really, but, but has it caught on? Are we doing it, a lot of it or what's going on and what the cost is right now? Uh, that's all changed too, Alice, just by lumber prices. So as we say, nothing stays the same in real estate for very long, yet it's the big driver of our whole economy. Yes, it is. Uh, so don't touch that dial. We have a great show coming up for you. Pete Belcastro, Alice Lima with The Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to The Real Estate Show, folks. I'm Alice Lima here with my co-host, Pete Belcastro, and uh, we are welcoming Don McCoy of EXP Realty. Hi, Don, how are you? Hey, thank you, Alice. Thank you, Pete. Sure, appreciate it. I know what you guys go through when it comes to putting together shows and getting things lined up. I did it for five years, huh, Pete? You and me way back when. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna wait. Alice probably doesn't know this, but Don and I go back to when this station, uh, which we're on, KCMX, this group, we, we, we used to meet down in the middle of a, of, of a cow field, right? With uh, that's right. Really? Yeah. Really? That's what yeah. He was okay. doing sports and I was doing open talk and uh, cows looking in the window at me while I was talking to the public. So. Oh, that's hilarious. No, <laughs> yeah. we didn't know that. We didn't know that. Well, here it is full circle. <laughs> yeah. And that tells you how old we actually are because that was a long time ago when those stations were located down there in the south part of Ashland. Uh, at that time, yeah. Long, anyway, that was fun. Don Don was one of the first uh, really radio talk uh, talk hosts uh, around anywhere. Uh, was yeah. Don? Anyway, and now we have yeah. both been state brokers at the at the end here of our careers. That's been <laughs> an interesting journey. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, I know what you go through, Alice. It's it's not it's not a simple little task. You know, you have to keep things lined up, keep alert to. Um, the subjects at hand and boy this last month sure showed some interesting stuff in real estate huh uh yes we did it was just uh you know it's always changing pete and i talk about this every single week but i uh, would love to hear your observations don 
Well, um, just in the last 30 days, Jackson County had uh, had new listings outpace pending. So more listings coming on, more than there were pendings by 34. Uh, 34 uh, new listings above the pendings. 397 homes were listed and 363 went pending. That's incredible. Yeah, a lot of activity. And in Josephine County, that was Jackson County, 44 more listings than they had go pending, which uh, is about 25% more. 180 homes were listed and 136 went pending. So that's that's kind of good news. Well, we, we knew that it was going to be the time when listings were going to be coming back because it was back in February, Don, when that was that number that you talked about, 397 there. That's all in Jackson County, by the way, only in Jackson County. Those numbers were down around 220, uh, almost a 200, you know, kind of thing. So we have definitely been coming back up. You're right about that. The question always is, is where, well, where are they then? Uh, and, and what price category are those numbers in? And when yeah. you look, to, when you start to drill down, a core, almost a quarter of that entire 397 are luxury properties. The luxury market has a lot, a lot of properties. But when you start looking down in that, you know, 350 range, that maybe 325 range, uh, boy, it drops to, you know, like maybe 10% of the available inventory. It's very, very little. In fact, there's only, I think it's, uh, well, anyway, very, with below 350, there's less than 100, 100 homes in all of Jackson County for sale. So you're right. But that's what we have come up, and that's the good news. Yeah. And there, there are more coming on the market, which is nice in those lower price ranges. And some of them are not getting scooped up as fast as they were. So uh, what are your um, thoughts on the market changes, Don? Well, I just, you know, it's June. Um, the entire month of June is pretty much behind us. And, uh, and I'm just thinking that, you know, every year it kind of gets a little quiet for some reason in June. A lot of closings happen in May, in my experience, and had a great year, by the way. My gosh, amazing how, how much real estate took place through to date for me personally in my little neck of the woods. The pandemic has really had a huge impact on Southern Oregon uh, buyers and sellers. Um, and with all the new people moving in and the prices changing, uh, Pete and I talk about this every week, if uh, those price points are still going to stay up there or if they're going to soften a little bit. Yeah, you know, that's an ongoing discussion with my clients, uh, my listings, people that are in the hunt that are almost locked out of the market right now. Uh, they're chasing the market, trying to get uh, their buying power up. And when's the market going to adjust? When's it going to come down? And, you know, I just say, gosh, short of another 9-11, you know, a huge catastrophe that just freezes the entire economy, then I don't see it softening as long as we have huge demand. You know, and that's a, that's the a thing I wanted to bring up that maybe you've talked about. But it's interesting in the stats in the last five years, what kind of sales we've had June through June of each year. So, so June of 2020 to June of 2021, we had 4,057 sales, okay? That means there were that many listings out there available, of course. But prior years, four prior years, we had quite a few less. Uh, in sales, they were only in the 3,000 range, 3,800, 3,700, 3,600. So to me, what that looks like is that there's actually plenty of listings. We just have more buyers. We have a right. ton of buyers right. out there. Yeah. And, and yeah. they're snatched up as fast as possible because the market's just, they're chasing after the market and they want to get it while the getting's good, so to speak. It's about to change. What we're going to see happen, and it's begun, is that interest rates are going to start rising just because, you know, the inflationary things that we're seeing in the country. So we're going to see that, you know, I think we're, we've, I think we've plateaued. Alice and I, again, we've talked about this a little bit that, you know, you can't, you can't force, you know, a turnip through the spoon uh, if you, at a price. In other words, a $300,000 house cannot sell for $600,000 in this market. And so I'm wondering just, you know, what you think, because we're seeing a really big change there. 
uh, in terms of uh, interest rates are going to put a big, big damper because people have been able to afford the five and six hundred thousand dollar range who couldn't have afforded that if interest rates were another point or point and a half higher. Yeah, I, well, I, I agree with you this with all these new tax changes and and all of the shifting going on in this uh, administration or the and, and the promise or the concern about it, it's it's most likely going to affect interest rates. And so people that are savvy ought to really get after it and get their house now. Um, but at the same time, the, you know, with, like you said, Alice, the COVID has had such an effect on our marketplace and that a lot of people have decided to sell their properties. And so that's part of this mix, I believe. Why we've had so many in this last year compared to prior years is a lot of landlords said, I'm done, I am through. And I'm going to put my property on the market and get out from underneath this headache. So you couple that with the with the potential. We haven't seen it yet, but I think what you're saying is right, Pete. I think it's coming. We're going to see in, uh, interest rates adjust up, and then that's really going to slow things down a little bit and and quiet things down. And then prices might start dropping a bit. For example. In Jackson County, the, the average price was $510,000. And, you know, well, that's good for, you know, sellers. I mean, you know, overall, I mean, that's, again, that's the average price. Uh, a lot of people are forced out, you know, of the market in that, in that condition. And what, what do you think? I mean, what, what we're seeing is really anything below $350,000 where most of us are. Is that still the big chunk of the majority of the sales? Uh, the majority of the sales are not coming up here at 900000 and a million dollars. <laughs> 50, 25, they just go so fast. Uh, they, they disappear. So what are you advising a client's Don to get ready for this? Because, you know, it, it's in a tough competitive market. Yeah, it really is. Um, you know, I have a client right now that, um, wanted to write uh, love letters to their would-be seller and um, and trying to get the edge, you know, on anything like that. And, is, and that, <clears throat> that I thought, well, okay, let's just do it. Let's make it happen. And then look what the state legislature just did. Yeah. Um, yeah, isn't that interesting? And he Would was you, a real estate uh, agent, that state legislature. Well, actually did it. Stop. <laughs> Do Don? What I don't understand. What was that? I, I don't. I don't know that. Um, he's. They passed a law that says you can't write love letters to the seller. So oh, please it's consider discriminatory. me and my family. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. They, they called it discriminatory. I listened to the guy on the radio um, interviewed trying to explain his position, and I could kind of see it. But at the same time, my gosh, if if um a listing agent and a buyer's agent has have some information. It's, it's part of the free speech uh, mechanism that's going on and the seller doesn't have to pay attention to it or they do, you know? So the thing is that's all been cut off now and they've made it illegal to write letters <laughs> to that. So what else is coming? Not only the letters, but photographs. And then if you didn't win the bid, uh, people were getting sued. So uh, they just decided to eliminate it completely. Whether that's right or wrong, we don't know. We live in Oregon. We just get used to every couple of years getting new rules, right? <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Well, that's the letter sure. shows they can't tax it. They can't tax real estate, uh, which they love to do but they can regulate more, which they're trying to do and going to do. Uh, yeah. so, well, that, you know, in one way, you know, look, you guys, in one way, that's an interesting thing. I've had clients do both of those things. I know you have too, where they wanted, they wanted to write a letter. And these weren't necessarily in big competitive kind of situations. Uh, some people like doing that. Some people don't. Uh, it's up to them. I think you're right. They have that choice. That's the problem with so, with so much of this. They can't figure out that the, that the sellers are pretty smart people, Don, and they can figure that out and they can accept yeah. that on their own without the government telling me you can't do that. I mean, this guy seems kind of stupid to me. It really <laughs> does. It's pretty far reaching and, and discriminatory based upon what? The seller is going to leave money on the table for a better deal just because he got a love letter from somebody else. I mean, come on, follow it through. 
But um, anyway, that's all done. So as far as advising clients on how to get in into these deals, um, I've been using escalation clauses from time to time. And so have other agents and uh, trying to get a little bit of an edge based on how high they can go. But the all cash deals are wiping us out every time. Yeah, and a lot of those are from the relocators or a few of them have taken, locals have taken money out from, you know, the big run up we had last year. So anyway, that's, um, it's an interesting time, as they say, and uh, we're living through it. We're riding this uh, strange wave that we're on. And I'm just, you know, the cost, that's the other thing we haven't even touched on. It's the cost of, of building a house now and the costs of maintaining a house now, just, just replacing HVAC units, for goodness sakes, look what's happened to those wholesale costs and then retail costs to the consumer. Well, um, we've got a quick break coming up here. Uh, we're interviewing Don McCoy of EXP Real Estate. Uh, Pete Bel Castro, Alice Lima, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Don't go away. Welcome back, folks, to The Real Estate Show. I'm Alice Lima here with Pete Belcastro. We're both brokers here in Southern Oregon for John L. Scott. And we're having a very interesting market discussion with Don McCoy of EXP Realty. And Don McCoy is also a green building expert of sorts. So wanted to check in with you about that, Don, because we haven't talked to you for a long time. And, and now, uh, you know, the shutdown is over. So uh, what's going on with the, uh, the green building movement? Well, as a lot of people know, uh, almost every contractor now that builds a house is is uh, pretty savvy on green building because it's all in our building codes. I mean, the state of Oregon is just so far reaching and so far ahead of so much the rest of the state, the uh, states in the United States that they have written this, these green concepts, uh, energy efficient concepts, healthy concepts right into our building codes. What I think is interesting is uh, this big push on solar, uh, trying to trying to make houses solar ready, so to speak. They go ahead and plumb it and get it ready. That those kind of mandates are coming down on contractors. And in just this last year, I've had some interesting experiences on the solar world. I had um, one one client call me, or it, it was a um, um, it was a see what was it? Yeah, it was a it was a homeowner. And he found me on the internet as a green realtor. And he said, hey, um, we're thinking about buying this house that has solar on the roof. And the real estate agent we're working with says that, uh, go ahead and take it off. It doesn't have any value. And don't put it back on since they're replacing the roof. So here they are replacing, putting a brand new roof on, there's solar on it. He says, just take it off and leave it off. It doesn't have any value. And so I thought that was pretty strange because at least solar provides less energy bills, all right, once it's on the house, once it's there. And so I called a couple of appraisers and they said, you know, I, I agree with you. It does add some energy. Um, it adds some uh, value to the house, but it's like a swimming pool. You know, they can only give so much value. They can't, if you put a $100,000 swimming pool in, sorry, you don't get a hundred thousand more for your house. Likewise, on a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars solar system, you you don't get that back on the appraised value. And so, several times this last year, this has come up. And so, maybe you get costs associated uh, with your with your credits, your tax credits. Maybe that helps. But anybody putting solar on their house, there's not a payback for a long, long time. The only payback you get is your refrigerator still runs when the power goes off, which we've recently seen. Ah. You, know, you can still run some lights and you, you've got a little bit of, um, you know, security, if you will, by having solar. And if that's worth it to you, spending twenty five, thirty five thousand dollars $35,000, depending on the size of your house, maybe more, um, if that's worth it to you, because the payback is 25, 30 years. And by then, you've got to have... <laughs> You've got to have maintenance on that thing. It's the, you know, it's the cost. It's the cost. I mean, no matter what they say, if, if this is going to take off in the country, in my opinion, uh, the government, and I hate saying that, is going to have to support homeowners who want to convert. I'm just trying to get my house converted, my farmhouse, because I've got lots of solar. 
and the cost I think uh, two different do two different bids. One was thirty six thousand. One was forty eight thousand. Well, that's a lot of money, I think, you know, to do that. And I, and I, I, I haven't, I haven't done it yet or anything because exactly what, exactly what you're saying, the, the payback is a long time out. Can I just improve my efficiencies without having to put that money in? One of the alternatives though, that I've seen a lot of people have done, which is maybe smarter and a whole lot less money is to put uh, enough solar on your property just to do hot water. Uh, oh, because that's interesting the number one consumer of power is creating hot water. And this way uh, I've seen that I've sold a place with that and the electric bills are really quite reduced. I, I was kind of surprised, but anyway, there are alternatives, but the cost of that to do that on your property, well, this is without trenching or without lots of different other things. And I had my house already prepared uh, for solar when I had to redo my, uh, my, my you know, uh, my, my electric here at the farm. So even with that, it's still thirty six thousand bucks, Alice, or forty five, you know, forty five thousand bucks. It's a lot of money, and that's why so many people opt not to do that. But hot water is an alternative. There's a lot less to to be done. You have to go through a plumber in order to do that. By the way, yeah. Uh, so, Don, one of the questions we get asked about solar frequently is if you can generate enough. Um, uh, extra electricity to sell back to the power company. Can you uh, yeah. comment on that? Yeah. Um, in fact, just a few weeks ago, I had uh, some clients that I sold a house to about three years ago, and they wanted to go solar. And so they their house was only not even 1,400 square feet. Well, there was the solar array they were putting on the roof would have given them a credit back of a whopping... $35 a month. Meanwhile, just as you were saying, Pete, the cost of putting it on to them was 30 grand. And, and so I said, okay, at $35 a month, and okay, you don't have any energy bills. What are your energy bills? They said, oh, uh, like 60 to $80 a month. I said, okay, say $80 a month times 12. What do you got? You know. <laughs> so how many years... Are you going to live in this house? Well, we're thinking about selling and going back to Montana. We like it up there. I said, yeah. then, <laughs> then you're wasting $30,000 for a $35 payback and a savings of $1,000 a year. I mean, come on. You know? <laughs> I wonder, I wonder what, because, uh, uh, you know, right now, look at the amount of electricity being consumed in our communities with this drought and this heat that we have been all experiencing which just drives electric use. Uh, and so I'm wondering if, you know, Pacific Power has already warned of possible rolling blackouts or things like that, because I'm sure our communities are, are consuming a lot, of, a lot of power right now for people trying to stay cool in this, in this heat. Don, let, let me ask you a quick question uh, about rural properties, because I know they're, they're near and dear to you as well. Uh, and we don't have any water. Uh, and, you know, I brought this up with uh, 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 Alice and I had lunch with uh, Tina Grimes from the head of the Rogue Valley Association of Realtors recently. And, we, and I asked about this question because, you know, we sell rural properties based upon, you know, water and irrigation. And we don't have it right now. And we have to warn buyers and sellers about that because I think all of a sudden a new paradigm exists now that we, you cannot guarantee that you will get water now every year from here going forward. Do you agree with that or tell me what you, what you think? I do. And, you know, look what happened, looks what's happened to our reservoirs and then uh, the, the um, rationing, if you will, if even they ration it when they open up the uh, irrigation uh, ditches, they have to be so careful. And it looks like, you know, if we don't get any more serious rain, which when do we ever in this summertime, um, they're, and, and in the future, you can't guarantee anything. And that's the whole thing with rural property. You know, people, well, how does a well work? What's it? How do septic systems work? Well, how does irrigation work? All these issues are extremely serious. So I think properties that are, that are close to like the river and um, have a very secure irrigation source, their values are gonna do one thing and that's gonna continue to rise especially if you have industry going on from hemp farms to cattle ranching to 
vineyards, you know, whatever that might be, you need that irrigation in a serious, serious way. If you're inland and you're having to have water hauled, look out. And then look what just happened to us with this big chlorine shortage in the entire state of Oregon and Pacific Northwest and even across the country. We, they, you know, who would have ever thought that we run out of chlorine and then all of a sudden, you know, we're getting, where you're not supposed to use water on your lawns in downtown. So it, it's not just rural property. It's right here in, in the city of Medford, for example. Well, we've, Do you, well, are you familiar with yeah. that? Well, we've never well, seen we've any never seen it. And uh, yeah. we're only, we're, we're even Fourth of July weekend, by the way. So we're only just beginning summer. And look how dry, as you say, the water levels and the kinds of things out there. It's just a, it's just a notice. And I think that Realtors and all of us need to be aware of, especially looking at rural properties right now, because they'll they'll say, you know, you got water and you've got this kinds of things, and and we we need to tell people to buyers that uh, that may not quite be as uh, accurate now going forward, because and that's going to reduce values. I think it's going to especially different different types of of, of rights and things and. What's going to happen if we only get a little bit and only so many people get it and this kind of thing? So what a we don't want to go through that. It'll be just a mess. And uh, hopefully, you know, we will get through it. Uh, but it's changing the way we look at these properties again. Uh, from a few years ago, remember, we were in the cannabis rush. Then we went through the hemp rush. And now we're going through the water kind of rush right, right at the moment. And uh, it changes all the time for rural properties right now. And I think we're going to go through a big change here in the future. And we need to warn buyers about that situation going forward. Well, and I think right. we may also impact the desirability of our area for commercial farmers. I mean, regardless of what crop or animal du jour we have in Southern Oregon, because we do cycle through different kinds of, um, of crops and, and profitable animals in our agricultural area. But now that people have more choices about where they can live because remote working and this and that and technology, I'm a little worried that, you know, we might not get as many farm type people wanting to live here because they don't have consistent water. Yeah, that's that's really a good point. It, it's just a serious issue. It's one of the other issues that our uh, Southern Oregon region has to be very concerned and alerted to. But it can shift back. We can start getting, who knows, we can start getting our rain back again, our snowpacks back again, which are so critical. I mean, who can predict the weather that far out to know that it's always going to be disastrous? The farmers have always realized the difference between on and agriculture wise in the Klamath Basin right now, there's a lot of sprinkling going on. It's all coming from wells, deep, deep production wells. The Rogue Valley doesn't have that deep production wells underneath it's underneath it. And so you're not seeing hardly any sprinkling going on. And they're planting things. There's a lot of water hauling going on. Go up to where they up to uh, uh, the Duff treatment plant out where Medford own the Medford Water Commission. Their trucks are lined up out there waiting for water to haul water to wells for everything all over Jackson County. Right. And it's the only first. We're not even to the 4th of July yet. And water hauling right now is probably the, uh, well, I don't know, the top thing to do right now. You make, make the most money right now, but you got to have permits and things like that. But they're lined up out there, Don, trying to get water hauled to, to, to people. Yeah, they sure are. It's very serious time. And then uh, hopefully we have a light fire season and I hope people are really, really careful and don't use uh, fireworks this, this weekend, you know, on a personal level. And I just hope, I hope we don't have any more problems like we've had. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, we're speaking with Don McCoy of EXP Realty, a green realtor, uh, active realtor here in Southern Oregon. Uh, Pete Belcastro and Alice Lima, your host of The Real Estate Show. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Do not touch that dial. Well, welcome back to the Real Estate Show, folks. I'm Alice Lima here with Pete Bell Castro. We're both real estate brokers, John L. Scott here in Southern Oregon. And, you know, um, in talking to Don McCoy um, of EXP, the interview we just finished, Pete, it's very interesting how we all had such a monumental experience of selling real estate Um helping buyers, helping sellers during the pandemic. And now that things are starting to open up a little bit, we're getting more listings finally. 
Well, it, but it was it was going to happen sooner or later. And uh, it wasn't like we weren't getting listings coming on. I mean, they were pretty consistent. What was happening, as Don pointed out, was that the demand was just so great in some price categories that it just kind of wiped out those new listings. So it seemed like nothing was ever changing. There was still nothing, nothing to buy where, in fact, there was. It's just that demand was so high. Uh, and that really, I think, is probably what we're looking at at the summer as we get to the 4th of July now and beyond that is uh, what is the demand going to do in July and August? Because we've always said, look, you got you got to hit a plateau sometimes with pricing. And uh, 24, from June to June uh, a year ago, uh, that price was risen had risen by 24 uh, percent throughout the average in Jackson County. So we really have to watch that affordability issue. It can only go up so high. Things, things like that. And really this last week, uh, even though uh, it was a kind of a robust week again, the number of closed sales, the number of listings in Jackson uh, County went down uh, for the first time in a while. Each week there, were, there was over 105 closings last week. There was only 80, for example, this last week. So, you know, it, things have to, have to simmer down. As Don pointed out, June usually kind of does that. What July is going to bring, I really don't know. And if we get smoke from these fires that have started that are around us, and I know it's drifted in and out of the Rogue Valley and even in the Klamath Basin, for example, if we get that early and starts and it stays and is persistent, Alice, again, all bets are going to be off again. What else do we need? We're trying to come back through the economy and smoke could be very well with us. That would be really disastrous, I think, all across the board for everything. So, you know, uh, even though it's good, it can't continue this way it's got to level this way which i think it has well and you know we're we're a little bit off of our seasonality in my opinion just because the the covid shutdown just really it's like a restart on everything and then with the threat of the interest rates going up um a little bit every so often i'm seeing a huge surge of buyers you know people are ever more committed to getting that uh first time home to getting that investment property so um i i really want to encourage people if they did think about listing to go ahead and get that get that property on the market because i i'm thinking there's going to be ever more buyers than there were before what do you think about that well, well and the reason there are look buyers are not stupid here i mean they <laughs> they're they not hear <laughs> they hear us talk, talking about buyers know what's going on. So what's happened, I think, and we can certainly talk to Guy Giles about this, I think maybe next week, is that uh, people know that interest rates are going to be higher. They're trying to get locked into an interest rate that's still mm. maybe 3% or 3.2 or something like that before it goes to 3.5 or 3.75, you see? So mm-hmm. the buyers all of a sudden rushed in here trying to get uh, pre-approved, get my, get my, you know, get it ready to go. When the, when the property came because we didn't want, they wanted to lock in the interest rate rather than wait. Now, is there enough to satisfy all that group or what prices they're looking at or they're ranged in uh, or what they're approved for uh, is in a whole nother story. <laughs> that would be a whole other show we could do on that. But uh, they're out there. You're right. The demand is still there. That has not, that has not changed. Even from local folks who are going to try to downsize or upsize their own life. We, we forget about that, Alice. We always talk about people moving here. What about people who are here who, you know, uh, remember, 40% generally are from outside the area moving here. 60% of our sales have generally been people who were here either moving up or down. Now, that, that, that may have changed, but where are they going and what are they doing? If that, you know, if we can help them get ready to do that, then we're going to have more listings coming on when those sellers can find their replacement property. Uh, that's right now, it's still different, as you know, that's still difficult to do. Yeah, but the market conditions seem to be tolerating the idea of sellers having more time to find a replacement property. At least I'm seeing quite a bit of that. There are some buyers that just can't give that to a seller, but for the most part, the buyers are being coached by good real estate uh, agents that if you can offer that to the seller, you might get in a better position. But the idea that you can use this opportunity post shutdown, there's so much cash. People didn't spend any of their money if they were 
in a situation where they could continue working, uh, they just didn't spend any money. And so they were, did you see on the financial news this week, they're reporting people just have these stockpiles of cash. And then in Southern Oregon, at least our property prices went up so fast that they're in a good position to go ahead and upside and still have a pretty good reasonable payment. Well, they're putting money, they're putting money down. Remember, I think it was big, big most, time. Uh, realtors said it was, a, was it was half of all sales. I think it was the month of April of this year. Uh, the buyers put it. 